Welcome and thank you for joining us for the 2023 Hidden Wounds of War Conference. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we are excited to have you with us. For those of you joining us online, questions can be submitted using the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. My name is Brent Holmes and I currently serve as the Associate Director of the Hounstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. As a veteran myself, it is an honor to be affiliated with an organization founded by a legendary brother in arms, Colonel Ralph W. Hounstein. Serving as General Eisenhower's Chief of Intelligence during World War II, Colonel Hounstein witnessed the atrocities of combat, including being one of the first, being among the first Allied forces into liberated Dachau concentration camp. I have to believe that he would be proud of the commitment of the Hounstein Center and Grand Valley State University extends to those who have served our communities and our nation. The Hidden Wounds of War Conference would not be possible without the generous support of our members and donors. We are also grateful for our partners for this conference, Grand Valley State University's Peter F. Secchia Military and Veterans Resource Center, the Kent County Veterans Service Office, and the West Michigan Veterans, the West Michigan Veterans Coalition. I would also like to thank the Hidden Wounds of War Planning Committee, Dr. Bart Beekner, Martha Burkett, Allie Gedicke, Jill Wolf, Stephen Lipnicki, Dr. Michael Ryan, and Cheryl Mankel. Today's program will include a morning and afternoon keynote along with breakout sessions. After the morning breakout session, you'll be released for lunch. Lunch will be provided out in the X Hall right outside the auditorium. I now have the privilege to introduce our first keynote presentation, a communal intervention for military moral injury with Chaplain Chris Antel, Dr. Peter Yeomans, Leroy Anthony Ank, and Sergeant Hannibal Collett. Chris Antel worked as the clinical chaplain at the Corporal Michael J. Crescens VA Medical Center in Philadelphia since 2015. Chaplain Antel, was, has written and taught about moral injury, and he co-leads a group for moral injury at the VA. He has been a congregational minister and a military chaplain, and those experiences inform his clinical work. Peter Yeomans has worked as a clinical psychologist at the Corporal Michael J. Crescens VA Medical Center in Philadelphia since 2019. He is currently the team leader of the PTSD outpatient clinic team and had previously spent many years addressing co-occurring PTSD and substance use disorders as part of outpatient addiction services. He has written and taught about moral injury and he co-leads a group for moral injury at the VA. Leroy Anthony Ank served three deployments in Iraq as a Marine Corps infantry person with the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, the most decorated infantry unit in the United States Marine Corps. Leroy has lived in Alaska, graduated law school, worked for the US House of Representatives, and coached high school wrestling on two national title teams. Currently, he is a writer and public speaker who resides in South Philadelphia with his seven-year-old daughter. Sergeant Hannibal Colick is a retired civil affairs specialist who served in the United States Army from 2002 to 2017. During his career, he was deployed twice to Iraq and served as a training coordinator in charge of preparing soldiers to go overseas. Since retiring from the military in 2017, Sergeant Colleg has been active in his community, particularly with addressing the issue of moral injury among veterans. Please join me in welcoming Chris, Peter, Hannibal, and Leroy to our stage. Hey, thanks so much, Brent. Uh, everybody here at the center has been absolutely fantastic. I wanna thank them for organizing this event, being such kind hosts. Um, if we could just take a second and have another round of applause for the staff and support people here today. If you would, please, thank you. They've been absolutely amazing. So we're kind of inverting the usual presentation style with, we're gonna start with uh, patient experience first and then uh, allow the clinicians to speak to the model that we use and some of the uh, research and findings that we've discovered with our ceremonial approach to treating moral injury uh, there in Philadelphia. So we're gonna start out this morning with a little experiential exercise. And this is the first time we've done this with folks who, uh, where the crowd is predominantly veterans. So uh, bear with us. Um, no need for applause. 
No need to uh, say anything. You just take a look around the room. We're going to ask folks to stand up, sit down. Hopefully you don't feel like you're back in church. Um, and then what, when we're standing, uh, after we're done standing and sitting, we'll take a, a couple seconds to kind of let things sink in. So uh, if you are a veteran of the U.S. military, would you please stand up? So we'll take a look around here. Thank you. You can, you can sit down. We're going to ask a series of questions, and if you agree or relate to that question, you can go ahead and stand up, and, and Hannibal's going to kick us off. We'll have a little pause. We'll just take a look around and um, see, who's, see who's in the room and where they stand on things. If you would never intentionally kill another person under any circumstances, would you please stand up? So you're saying, I would never kill somebody under any circumstance. If you agree with that statement, you can stand up. I can name, I can name just one war and defend my reason as, as to why it was just. So if you can name a just war, a war that you agree with, go ahead and stand up. Not a loaded question. We're not trying to call anybody out here. Yeah. All right, everybody can sit down. Every capable adult U.S. citizen should be required to do mil military service. If you agree with that statement, you can stand up. All right. I, sh I share some responsibility for, for the killing that the U.S. military has done. All right. All right. If it gets to be too much, come on, just put your hand up or something. Yeah. We're not trying to hurt yeah, anybody's yeah, knees yeah. and back here. Yeah, yeah, you can put your hand up. I can train to kill and kill and still be a good person. The question is, I, I can train to kill and or kill and still be a good person. Okay. Finally, I can name one service member killed in combat, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, and those conflicts in between, or a veteran who's died by suicide or overdose. So I can name one KIA, one veteran who's committed suicide. Let's put the hands, let's get them up high. Let's take a look around. So we're talking about invisible wounds of war. We've all been touched in some way. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for being here today. So with our, our model at the VA for treating moral injury, one of the things that really resonated with me was how it differentiates itself from PTSD treatment, right? If you've had any treatment through the VA for psych conditions, it's usually a manualized approach where they start you out asking questionnaires, they develop a treatment plan, and then along the way, you revisit the same questionnaires and they wanna see how are the symptoms coming down? And the problem was PTS wasn't what I was struggling with. Moral injury was really what was, what I felt was, it was, so, it was what was giving me the sensation and the impression that something was deeply wrong. So when you look at PTS and the symptoms, one of the things they include in the symptoms is survivor's guilt, right? And so what questionnaire 
is going to address whether my survivor's guilt has moved from a 10 to a 7, and those symptoms have been reduced. What we do with our ceremonial approach, which you're going to hear about, and if you stick around tonight, you're going to get to participate in, we get below the neck. We move from the cognitive, the processing, the I hear or see or smell something and I have a conditioned response that produces stress in my body. We move from that to what was actually wrong with my experience? What did I see? How did I see commanders abusing their authority or getting people hurt or killed due to their incompetence? What broad injustices did I feel I witnessed or even minor injustices did I feel I witnessed during my military experience? When did I not speak up? When did I feel, wh where do I feel like I didn't do the right thing? Because I think it, it, if we're reflecting our military experience, many of us probably carry something in their mind where they go, man, I should have spoke up. Or if we're talking about combat, I should have pulled the trigger sooner, or I should not have pulled the trigger, and I regret that I did. And so those kind of thoughts left me feeling deeply ashamed. It left me isolated, feeling like I couldn't connect to people, that whenever there was a, a larger dialogue about military culture or the way our military is being used in Iraq or Afghanistan or in our foreign policy, I felt personally attacked and criticized. I felt like the people who were saying these things absolutely couldn't relate, that they had never been through what I'd been through and so that gap, that bridge, uh, bridging that gap was something that our ceremonial model did because for the first time, uh, you know, I, I don't know about some of you, like I had been to and in parades. I'd spoken at Veterans Day events or Memorial Day events. I'd remembered the lost. I'd been to the national cemeteries and placed wreaths or roses, but as engaging as that was, it wasn't getting to the root of what I felt was wrong. And so it always felt just, I appreciated it, but it felt a little superficial. So with our model, where we go, it's 10, 10 weeks uh, of closed group discussion where we learn about moral injury, how it differentiates itself from PTS. We develop our own definition of moral injury, so we make it personal. And then we get a profound sense of empowerment from getting up in front of a room full of people. Usually there's more civilians present when, when we do the ceremony. So they're VA employees, they're friends, they're family. They're people from the community, from our churches, from our clubs, you know, from, from the parks where our kids play together. And I had an opportunity to speak to my worst day, not my best day. And rather than having my service valorized, I could speak to what I felt was deeply wrong about my service and then engage in some ceremony of lighting candles, washing hands, even have some, some touch and feel compassion and feel, and, and here in the liturgy, we have a, a liturgy that we follow kind of like a church service. Here in the liturgy, civilians saying to me, uh, please tell us your story. Please tell us how we can be better, how our society, our nation can hear you, can listen to you, and can share in the moral burden you feel. So that was very profound and moving for me. Uh, you're, if you stick around for the ceremony, you're going to hear veterans who have just completed their 10 weeks and are now speaking for the first time to their morally injurious situations. So. Uh, for me, my morally injurious situation that I, I really worked on, there was a day we were in the first battle of Fallujah. Some of you may remember there were four civilian contractors. Uh, their vehicle was ambushed. They were killed. Their bodies were burned, hung from bridges. You know, the autopsy report showed that they had been, uh, you know, violated and mutilated in terrible ways. And there's some pretty iconic photos from this era in Iraq, 2004, of these, you know, burned, disfigured bodies hanging from bridges and people celebrating it. So that happened the second week I was on my second deployment. And uh, the president said, we're sending in the Marines. 
and I was one of those units. So uh, while I was in Fallujah, going for a resupply of food, uh, getting some boxes of chow, I was with you know, my, my fire team. We were behind friendly lines in the city, uh, no enemy activity to speak of. All of a sudden, a single round ricochets off a light post by my head, like a, a metal pole. You know, and everybody ducks and takes cover and we laugh, ah, you missed me, like, better luck next time. Uh, three days later, Sniper didn't miss, he killed Lance Corporal Adam Strain. And at the time, we were told, oh, we have these new ballistic Kevlar helmets that increase the survivability of a headshot because the way they're manufactured, they redirect the wound, the, the round, prevent fatal wounding. If you're medically evacuated within an hour and you get to that the field hospital and they can work on you, you have the golden hour, 96% chance of surviving, right? So here we are doing everything right. Lance Corporal Strain ends up in a, a vegetative state. And eventually when they try to move him, his body gives out and he dies. And we're going, holy cow, like, that's not supposed to happen. And then it occurs to me, holy cow, that almost happened to me. So a few weeks later after we pulled out of Fallujah, there was a, a big firefight in the village that we were operating in. And, um, you know, there was multiple units. We had road uh, helicopters flying around providing support. It was just melee through this whole village was, was basically a firefight. And a guy from another unit uh, who had been shot, probably incredible adrenaline and, and shock, uh, accidentally shot shot up civilian vehicles with civilians thinking they were running the checkpoint and we were the ones who were sent in to essentially triage the civilians who were hurt and while we were there we got an order to search them for weapons so as i'm approaching this this vehicle sitting in the square our corpsman has his kevlar off and you're going holy cow like if we're that on because we never took our kevlars off unless we were completely secure his kevlar off and his back up against the wall and we're all dirty and I see the tears cutting streaks down the dirt in his face and that's what I knew it was bad and I, I thought of a scripture that said if it's at all possible take this cup from me so around the corner and I see you know a child on the hood of the vehicle where Doc had been treating him and what we didn't realize was one of the 240 rounds had entered his head above the scalp exited, uh, you know, still above the hairline. Doc saw him laying in the back seat, pulls him out of the car, places him on the hood to treat him, and when he did, his head rolled, and his brain spilled out on the hood of the car. His mom is sitting there in the driver's seat, and we're going, holy cow, like, if this is a woman driving, like, they were probably pretty progressive, like, or they were probably, you know, a little more open to the messaging than other people generally, just broad. I don't know that for sure, but um, that tended to be how things went. She's sitting in the driver's seat, staring at her, her you know, two and a half year old on the hood with his brains and, and cerebral fluid dripping off the hood of the car and she's just screaming. And that's when I noticed that she had bone fragments and, and flesh in her hair and, and in her dress and her husband was next to her with multiple chest, chest wounds already past, already dead, uh, slumped over on her. And it wasn't just seeing an injured child. That happens a lot. You know, EMTs witness these, these terrible things pretty regularly. It was the way I felt about it because I knew in that moment, Word spread so quickly among the villages that we worked in, that, that we were operating in and trying to stabilize and secure. I knew in that moment that the local population would hear about this. And I saw a child suffering the fatal wound that I had, all, I, I potentially could have suffered. And in my mind, I thought, good, let these see what happens when they take a run at us and they miss. That was my thought. Everybody else was had their backs away, they're, you know, pulling security, they're forming a perimeter, and I'm, I'm staring, you know, unloading this kind of anger and wrath on the, the, this child in front of me. And it, it took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that I was a person capable 
of feeling those terrible feelings toward a, a, an innocent child and child's family and, and community. And so to be able to get up on a stage and speak to it and afterwards have people tell me I'm home, I'm safe, that they understand, they're trying to understand what it was like and then continue after graduating the class, um, after gr graduating the, the group, being provided acts of atonement. We have members of the I Iraq and Afghani community that we interact with in Philadelphia. We have uh, projects that we do uh, in concert with them. We have people who have sold, you know, got out of the military with expensive equipment and, and sold it and donated it to the Iraqi Children's Foundation to support schools and services on the ground in Iraq. So to be able to move from that deep isolating shame to the guilt of how I felt and my complicity in it, you know, I, I still remember reaching over that woman to pop the hood to check the car to see if we could find any weapons so that they could be labeled combatants instead of collateral damage. The indecency of that was disgusting to me and I hid from it for a long time. But here I had an opportunity to not just speak to it, but face it and share it with the community that was asking to be able to shoulder that burden with me through the moral engagement of our, our ceremony. So uh, thank you for your attention. It gives you a little context for maybe what I was speaking about when I went through the ceremony. You're gonna hear other veterans. If you do stick around for the ceremony this evening, you'll hear other veterans uh, speak to their you know, deep moral pain, and then we can help them shoulder that burden as well. So uh, thank you for your attention. No, you know, I don't know if it's, a, no applause, please. I'm just gonna hand it off to Hannibal. Thank you, Leroy. <clears throat> um, I was supposed to speak first because, uh, but every time I get around this type of, uh, we have these moments it's of remembrance. Um, sometimes I get a little touchy. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, the journey, the journey for me. Uh, and these dates seem like to line up all together of remembering um, certain parts of the journey. Uh, more, in, more injury, we had this more injury group and it allowed me to finally speak to um, family. And family that that I lost not too later, too much later. So, it gets a little touchy for me sometimes. Um, uh, when I learned about more injury in, uh, I was like, uh, what, what? is bottled up inside and then you you start to realize that you got these layers like an onion. Um, I came from poor community and then decided to go to the military and I'm going to war to, or a so-called war, I'm going to this conflict to go over there. And when I come down, we land, people look just like me. I'm like, these people look just like me. Something wrong with that. First thing, and I was told, I'm a civil affairs specialist. And I was told, oh, we got to help these people. All right, we got to help them. We got we to gotta help them. All right, but the next day, we got to go and tear up 
this neighborhood. You gotta look for these IEDs mechanisms. We gotta, so I'm like, what, what's going on here? Um, how do I rationalize that in my mind where I have to go to a different country and don't know nothing about it at the age of 19, just coming into life, um, the beginning of just graduating high school, and um, got to go, go and rough up people or break down or be the cause of people dying. And you're like, for what? I can't understand this. But you don't even know how to process that for years. Like years, you shot a bottle, a bottle up. And you're like thinking about it, like, how can I rationalize these many people dying um, that look just um, like me, they talk? Um, like me, uh, how can I rationalize uh, this amount of violence? I can't rationalize it in my own community and uh, where I grew up in. I can't rationalize it now and today. But how can I rationalize it then at the age of eight? 18, 19, yeah, I was trained to, to, oh, I watched, I, I trained to, 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 to understand it, I guess, um, in basic training. I guess I had enough training, so two months of basic training, and then whatever job of training after that, and then couple of months of job. I guess I had enough training. No, I didn't have enough training. I can rationalize and having an interpreter um, who sacrificed his life just to help us translate um, uh, a little bit of information that was really not needed. Um, we probably could have called over the phone. So instead, I mean, instead of, uh, you know, we take the trip to go and, uh, and you make the trip or you make a decision to, to go to, to, to to a meeting that probably is not needed where they could communicate over the phone um, and and people are dying or people are losing their life or losing a limb and stuff like that. Uh, so um, the journey has helped me realize that there's layers to this. Um, But hmm. yeah. And he had asked me, I, uh, Never got a chance to talk about, well, I got, never talked to my family. And in the years I lost, this last year I lost my mom, my gra grandma, and my, and my father. And I finally got to tell them some parts of my story. Um, and it was hard. It's like, at least I told them before they died, um, before they passed.
And so that's why I continue to share um, and not try to be afraid to share my story. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chaplain Antal and um, Dr. Peter Yeomans. Yeah. So you heard a little bit about where we were at, uh, a little bit about the treatment we received, the benefits, where we're at now. So uh, yeah, Dr. Peter Yeoman, Chaplain Chris Antall, they're going to get into a little bit more of the details and the nuts and bolts of our group and how it operates for you guys. I'm gonna, we'll turn it over to them. Well, good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you. And again, thanks for uh, welcoming us to your conference. I'm the psychologist um, half of um, uh, collaboration here in Philadelphia that the four of us are describing to you. And um, first, I want to just talk a little bit about definitions of, of moral injury. I'm not going to go through them, um, sort of acting on the assumption that uh, the audience is uh, at least somewhat familiar with the idea of moral injury and how it's been defined. But I like this slide because it, it really shows an evolution or perhaps an expansion of how we are thinking about moral injury and, and where Chris and Leroy and Hannibal and I are landing uh, on that spectrum. So, of course, Shay first with his emphasis on betrayal, listening to the narratives of Vietnam vets, Litz and company add an important emphasis on perpetration, transgression. Other people like Irene Harris have written more like contextualizing moral injury in the individual faith community and perspective, which really hadn't been sufficiently done, but we're seeing much more of that now. Harris is also a psychologist. Um, especially since COVID, we've, we, we're seeing more this idea of moral injury applied beyond the military context, right, in terms of healthcare, issues around incarceration and such. And, um, but mostly here, I want to raise up uh, the words of uh, my colleague, Chris, um, uh, and how he managed to articulate an idea which I think is really central to the model that we're using here. Uh, and that is the unfair distribution of appropriate moral pain. So let's let's unpack that a little bit. So appropriate moral pain, right? Since the outset of uh, since moral since moral injury first started this journey of language and understanding, um, the assumption has been that this is normative, right? And and that's shouldn't we never want to lose that? There are debates these days about whether moral injury should somehow be moved into a diagnostic category, a category of disability, and we think we would really lose an important emphasis. This is normative, that given human sensitivity, human morality, whether it's faith-based or secular, our deep, deep calling to be good people, to treat others well, given those and the moral complexity of military service, war and stateside, um, that moral pain <clears throat> is, is appropriate and perhaps likely, given the nature of what people are asked to do and witness. And that moral, when you start to look for them, you realize moral, the moral dilemmas are uh, ubiquitous uh, throughout military service and particularly in theaters of war, right? Scenarios and moments where there is no good choice. There is no choice that is not going to leave you looking back and feeling like you came up short. These are impossible choices. Chris writes about the unfair distribution, and he's going to say more about that as we go through our presentation, but just for a minute there. Right? The idea here is that If our democracy and society is functioning properly, um, the moral weight of war should be distributed across the entire population. Part of why, or a lot of why, moral, um, the moral weight of war is so heavy on the shoulders of our service members is because it's not being shared, right? 
more than perhaps any other time in the history of our country, we, we are living at a time when most of the population is very disconnected from the realities of service, the complexities of service, the cost, financial, psychic costs of service. Um, they're largely uh, disconnected and perhaps um, their only source in some ways for trying to understand service and warfare is through movies and video games, of course. So the result of that is the weight, the moral weight, which is normative and inevitable is shouldered by the veterans uh, and literally crushing them and killing them. We know moral injury is associated with uh, higher rates of suicide and other violence in the home, substance use, all this has been shown empirically. Meanwhile, we are a distracted people. A lot of different studies we could cite, but these are just a couple to um, bolster what we're arguing. Um, how few of us, uh, and I know I understand there's a large veteran audience um, uh, in Michigan today, which is wonderful. Uh, but thinking of the, the predominantly civilian audience, how few of us uh, have personal connection um, how few young people um, affiliate or know of um, older gener are connected to older generations who have served. So, so then we tend to think about moral injury as a community wound, right? In the spirit of moving the medical model's emphasis of pathology off the veteran right, to the community, right, that we could think in psychological terms that the, the larger public is in denial, right, they're, def they're defending themselves against the painful realities of war uh, and are in a state of denial. It's too painful to look at and they have the privilege to look away. Um, Chris and I have both been greatly inspired by the work of uh, Edward Tick, it's written some wonderful books on these issues and, and um, seemingly playfully, but actually quite seriously, he has alternate acronyms for PTSD, a few of them. Well, one of them that applies here is post-traumatic social disorder, right? Which is such a powerful way of taking a familiar acronym of pathology off the veteran and reconceptualizing it, reframing it, and really applying it to the, what we see playing out in the larger public, right? That there's social disorder, um, that the military um, is tremendously influential, costly, deadly. And given the moral weight of that, so few of us are really paying much attention uh, to what's going on. So by that measure, moral injury is a community wound. And our model then supports a community event. If we have a community wound, we need a community event to support healing. Um, we take some of our inspiration from many different people, but just to highlight some writing, Warren Kinghorn is a VA psychiatrist, but also has an appointment at Duke Divinity School. Here he is talking about um, rescuing moral injury from the medical model, right? Putting, um, calling for specific communal practices, allowing for truthful narration of healing, of com fragmenting combat experiences, the kind of stories that uh, Leroy and Hannibal are sharing with you this morning. Um, this was published in 2019 as sort of a summary of the literature on uh, moral injury and Journal of Traumatic Stress is really a highly reputable and influential journal for psychologists and behavioral health. And, and um, we were so heartened to see in their conclusion for future directions um, this basic reminder that this is not, we cannot think of this just as a intra-psychic con intra conflict. And that likely we need an affirmative community effort to understand and reintegrate the morally injured, as well as to accept shared responsibility for that injury. And Chris is going to say more about this idea of sharing responsibility. <clears throat> we also take inspiration from the words of William Mahady, who was a chaplain uh, in the Vietnam War and wrote a powerful book uh, afterwards, right? And he says, the voice of the veteran is raised in protest 
against the prevailing currents of our culture. It unmasks our delusions. So, in these words and also of Winnicott Leiden is the, the tenets really of our model that if we can support veterans in recognizing that their burdensome, story, their burdensome stories are one, not theirs alone, two, yes, they are too painful to be carried alone. They are unbearable, literally, to be carried alone. And three, might actually have value and purpose that in that pain and in, in those lonely truths, could those same stories be used to serve the public, uh, to wake the public up to the realities of war and to ask them to wrestle with the moral complexity of war and to assume some of that responsibility. The phrase that, again, attributing Chris, um, we, we've developed for that is the idea of moving from patient to profit. It's sort of been a useful catchphrase in our group, right? So a patient is someone um, who needs treatment, who needs care, who is injured, <clears throat> maybe needs to go to a medical center, um, but a prophet, right? A prophet is someone who has carries the uncomfortable truth, right? That is standing and calling to the public to pay attention, right? To, to understand the risks they're taking and how we need to respond. I was struck by how insidious the language of patient is. I mean, even Leroy, right, who's so connected to this model and this work, um, opens his remarks with calling themselves patients, calling themselves patients, and um, and the word treatment also. And 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 I, to me, that's a measure of how um, you know how we have. And even as we do this work, we've all internalized this model of. These people are patients, they need treatment, right? And we're really trying to uh, blow that up, frankly. Uh, let me tell you briefly, I'll just take a couple more minutes and turn this over to Chris. So um, practically speaking, what are the components of the group? It's 12 weeks, uh, 90 minutes. After the 10th week, we have a ceremony. Chris is gonna speak uh, uh, more about that, or I, I guess I am. Um, Small group, six to seven veterans. We've been running it for about six and maybe seven years, twice a year, and importantly facilitated by a behavioral health person and the chaplain here at our, at our VA. So the content is really designed to try to build vocabulary, helping people find language that fits their experience that they can use to describe and understand their experience and to understand the nature of their pain, right? To, to recognize that, that the pain they feel is the pain of conscience, right? And that isn't illness. Um, and since that's strength um, and that's commitment and how can someone honor that and find additional power in that, encouraging that to um, be true to their stories, to share their experiences and to continue to use their prophetic voice. So we talk about what is moral injury, what are core moral values, ask the veterans to look at where there was maybe moral dilemma and moral conflict in their work. What are moral emotions? Uh, we emphasize this distinction between guilt and shame, right? That, that maybe guilt and to some degree is, is normative and appropriate, right? Shame might be the feeling that really um, leads people to suicide, uh, if not at least to isolation, trying to minimize the damage of their presence, right? But guilt is calling us back into relationship, back into community. So how can guilt energize someone towards action? Uh, we try to um, help veterans identify um, ways in which we disengaged in our service experiences, perhaps inevitably and necessarily. And what is the answer to, to, to that? How can we reconnect to conscience and truth about moral complexity? I'll just say a little bit about the ceremony and Chris is gonna reference it as uh, he goes on talking about testimony, but actually the ceremony is today, as you may know, and uh, we know a few of you are signed up and we so hope that you will um, consider uh, spending a couple hours with us from four to six this afternoon 
It's a public event here at our medical center. It's a public event, right? So we welcome the public and we'll be gathering both in, in person and hybrid. It's a combination of, um, well, at the heart of it is our group members who are, has, they have a big day today. Um, their friends and family, VA staff come and often are really learning new perspectives they hadn't really been asked to consider in their work. Um, faith communities, spiritual leaders, general public, um, all will come. Um, the core contribution of the veteran participants is they share a personal definition of moral injury. And then similarly to what Hannibal and Leroy were just sharing with you, they have the option to, to share specific experiences and or how those experiences have impacted them. So I'm gonna uh, stop there and I'll, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to just um, start by acknowledging Hannibal and Leroy. Um, we've, we've done this group uh, since 2015, Peter and myself. 2016 was our first, first group, and we've had over 60 veterans come through uh, our 12-week group. And uh, you're joined today by two extraordinary veterans who are among uh, the veterans who've completed our, our group. Uh, Hannibal and Leroy recognize that their suffering is part of a, a larger social problem, and they have been able to transform the meaning of their trauma by making their stories a gift uh, to others. And by joining with others uh, in pursuit of a better world. And this is a, really an admirable mission. Uh, and it's been my privilege and continues to be my privilege to be a companion with them uh, on, on this journey that is, uh, as of this morning, taking them to Grand Rapids, Michigan. So. Uh, <clears throat> We've got until 9.45 um, and we want to make time for some dialogue, um, perhaps questions, perhaps just uh, feedback. Um, and uh, that means my part will be brief. I'll be back later at four uh, to give more of an orientation for those of you who choose to participate in our ceremony. Um, but uh, let me just um, say a bit more about our ceremony and sharing responsibility before we open it up to, to questions. Um, this slide is just to lift up the key element of testimony and our process of empowering veterans to give testimony uh, as uh, integral to recovery from this communal wound of moral injury. Peter mentioned this, the idea of veterans as prophets. And we like to draw in other writers and commentators, clinicians, uh, recognizing that our work builds upon a community of work and that ours is really a communal intervention uh, that uh, is built on many voices and many um, insights from multiple disciplines. Uh, the question of moral responsibility was raised this morning in the experiential exercise uh, and uh, several of those questions posed to you by Leroy and Hannibal. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about the question, uh, I share some responsibility for the killing done by the US military. And from where I'm at in Philadelphia, which is uh, far away with a limited view of the audience, uh, it seemed that everybody stood up. Was that what you were seeing, Leroy and Hannibal? Did everybody, I mean, almost everybody. Yeah, there's a lot of people on their feet, Chip. 
Yeah, there were there were a lot of people on their feet here. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So everybody, almost everybody, at least the majority of the people, uh, stood up. Uh, so there was some kind of acknowledgement. Yes, I do share some responsibility for the killing done by the U.S. military. I also noticed that um, nobody stood up, at least not that I could see, when the question was posed, every capable adult should be required to serve in the U.S. military. So that, I, I'm just observations here. Um, uh, did anybody stand up? Could, for, from your perspective, were you able to see anybody stand up uh, for that question? That's we, a question a about mandatory military service, about a draft. So, sorry, I interrupted you. I just said we had a couple in the back stand up. A couple in the back. Uh, this is also a question about responsibility. Um, there's sometimes a question that I, I also put out in this exercise, which is the United States should not have a military at all. And my experience is that nobody stands up for that. So there's a general sense that we must have a military, but often there's also a sense that, well, I don't want to be in it or I don't want my children to be in it. Uh, and that's what a draft might mean. The other thing I noticed, and this was really puzzling to me, was nobody stood up that I could see on the statement, I can train to kill and kill and still be a good person. I didn't see anybody stand up. And I'm just puzzled by that because what does that mean? Did you see anyone stand for that? Did people just not understand it? Or Leroy, what was your observation of the room? Uh, I think we were raising hands at that point. So, yeah, we had we had some hands go up Okay, that you might not have okay. been able to see. Okay. Just wanted, wanted to clarify. Um, so all of these, all of these questions are questions about moral responsibility and, and they're inviting us to reflect upon dimensions of moral responsibility and ask some difficult questions that I think we need to be asking. And, and Nancy Sherman has posed these questions, Judith Herman, most recently in a, in a beautiful new book called Truth and Repair. Who can be held responsible and liable for the intentional harm in, in warfare? And what might it mean to hold perpetrators accountable for repairing the harm they've done? What might it mean to hold bystanders accountable for acts of complicity and co collusion? And what about acts of omission, indifference, and willful blindness? These are tough questions to ask, but they're questions we need to ask. So there's been many calls, uh, and there's a lot of text here I'm not going to read, but many calls for greater sharing of responsibility in response to this phenomenon of moral injury. Uh, Edward Tick, Nancy Sherman, Rita Nakashima Brock and her book, Soul Repair. Uh, and more recently, uh, Michael Robillard and Bradley Strasser, two post 9-11 veterans who then went on to get PhDs and wrote uh, this book. Um, it's called Outsourcing Duty. Uh, there it is. The Moral Exploitation of the American Soldier. How do we share responsibility in practice? Well, this is how we're approaching the, uh, the answer to this question. And it's through the use of ritual and ceremony. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the order of service for one of our community healing ceremonies, like we're offering this afternoon. And as Libre mentioned, uh, there's a liturgical element. Uh, it's very scripted in a sense. We're inviting the community into a uh, sacred time and space in the sense of a time apart uh, where we're inviting a space of uh, enter a space of safety to c build trust, to repair relationships that have been broken and to provide 
a platform for our veterans to give testimony and some guided community response that is appropriate for the nature of the testimony that our veterans are sharing. When I say appropriate means often we don't know how to respond to the kinds of testimonies of moral injury. It means uh, we don't, we, we often will move towards applause when in this case, applause is not an appropriate response. Um, so, so this ceremony is a guided communal intervention that helps empower the veteran, but also guides the community on how to respond appropriately to the kinds of content that our veterans are bringing to the community in their testimony. This is an image of, of what a reconciliation circle looks like uh, at one, the final stage. This is uh, the guided communal response that is an integral part of our ceremony. It happens after the veteran's testimony. Actually, you can see Leroy uh, in this image. Um, the inner circle, these are veterans. The outer circle, these are civilians. And um, uh, I'll talk more about this in the orientation to the ceremony at four. Um, but what's happening in this moment is uh, uh, um, uh, I want to say that all of this is informed consent, that the veterans knew that they were entering into this uh, kind of process. They indicated in advance that they welcome touch, the hand on the shoulder, uh, and it was all uh, participatory uh, by informed consent. And, and I think that's really important part of our process and our ceremony that we tell the community, what we're going to do, we give them the choice to observe or participate at every stage uh, so that there's no element of coercion and there, we maintain an, a, a community trust. Uh, some veterans can look at this picture and, and kind of freak out. They're like, wow, wait a minute, I'm surrounded. I've got people I don't know and they got their hands on my back. So, so it, can, it can generate some kind of Reaction. So that's why I'm, I'm saying this right now to to relieve some kind of anxiety that, it, for example, if you do come, if you're a veteran, and you do come to the ceremony, you have a choice if you want to be part of this kind of event or if you just want to sit on the sides and watch it happen. And, and we will respect the level of engagement that you uh, choose to um, bring to the event. Uh, what's happening in this moment is the communal response, as I said, and there, there is an element of communal uh, confession, uh, or we might say in a less kind of religious language of accepting responsibility. Um, and it's printed, it's there for the community to see. I've highlighted it here in the order of service. Um, I, as, as the facilitator of the ceremony, say these words and invite the civilian citizens, not the veterans, the, the civilian citizens to say these words to our veterans as they have their hand on their shoulder. So this is a communal response, a citizen civilian response to our veterans. And it's a response that invites the community to share responsibility. Uh, you can see by the words, uh, it's specific uh, and it's, um, involves uh, accepting moral weight. And you can see the language of sharing responsibility. We share responsibility with you for all you've seen, all you've done, all you've failed to do, for all that has been done to you. We've learned some things over the past uh, seven years of doing 12 ceremonies uh, with over four to, I would maybe even say 700 people coming through these events. Um, one of the things that we've learned, and, and it's really kind of phenomenal, is that most people accept the invitation to share responsibility. Uh, most people have elected to participate in this process and say these words. Um, we've also learned that people need guidance. Uh, people are eager, uh, generally, uh, to at least the selective group that comes to our events to uh, understand how they can genuinely 
support our veterans and authentically um, engage in this content. Um, we've also learned that sharing responsibility for the moral harms of war is complicated. It's vague and varied, and there's no one size fits all that what it means for an individual to share responsibility for the harm of U.S. warfare is the work of the individual to figure out. Um, we've learned that there's different ways of looking at moral responsibility. It can be helpful to think of backward looking responsibility and forward looking responsibility. Uh, we've had high school students, we've had refugees from Iraq come to our ceremonies. So we've had to think about what does it mean for them to share responsibility? And is it appropriate to ask somebody who wasn't even alive when the US sent troops into Iraq to be responsible in a backward looking sense or in, in some kind of blameworthy moral responsibility sense? It doesn't seem appropriate or even sincere. At the same time, both refugees and, and young people could assume forward-looking responsibility in the, a sense of uh, bearing witness, learning uh, from past experience, and working together for a better future. This is a visual of how we talk about sharing responsibility with our group. We introduced this idea of a social contract uh, that the military uh, is under civilian control, uh, that the commander in chief of the military is the president of the United States, who is a civilian citizen elected by the consent of the people. So what this looks like, uh, and there's a lot here, but this is how responsibility is distributed uh, in the, the structure we have uh, in the United States. This service members take an oath to protect and defend. They become a member of the profession of arms. They're entrusted with the authority to kill and die under lawful orders. And um, they're under the command and control of elected leaders, ultimately the president, uh, who, uh, according to the Constitution, are authorized to raise troops to declare war. And um, this group of elected leaders is put into office by the consent of the people. So in this system of government we have, it's not a perfect democracy, but an imperfect, but nevertheless, uh, people's will is sovereign and people are free to give consent and also voice dissent. Um, okay. I'm gonna just um, finish up just with this idea of um, what it might mean to share responsibility for or, or complicity for the wrongdoing of another. We've heard um, our veterans speak about things that they were part of in their military service that left them feeling guilt and shame, uh, things that they concluded were wrong. And so part of sharing responsibility is to reflect on what might our complicity be in this kind of uh, harm. And I'm not conflating all intentional harm with wrongdoing. I think there's, of course, you know, very various perspectives on that. Uh, but to think about complicity in intentional harm and to think about complicity in intentional wrongdoing. I mean, those are two different categories, but there's things that are part of this process of, of thinking about our responsibility, moral responsibility. Um, so there's a, a number of ways uh, individuals can be complicit in the intentional harm caused by others uh, or wrongdoing um, perpetrated by others. And, and these, this is a way of thinking about that. 
uh, thinking about complicity and how uh, one person can be complicit in the intentional harm perpetrated by another uh, is a part of our moral responsibility to reflect on layers of complicity. Um, complicity in moral exploitation, and this is going back to Robillard and Strasser, uh, how uh, we as a, a community, uh, society are complicit in the moral exploitation of our soldiers. This argument has been laid out uh, eloquently by Robillard and Strasser in their book. Um, complicity in US war culture. Uh, this is uh, our colleague, Kelly Denton Borhog, who points to all of the structural and cultural elements of violence that feed into the direct violence that often is executed by the US military. And to reflect on sure responsibility is to reflect on our own complicity in structural and cultural violence and how we enable it and how we uh, are silent about it. Uh, and that is another dimension of what it means to share responsibility. And then also our, just our complicity in this uh, phenomenon of moral disengagement, of avoidance, of denial, of uh, uh, displacing responsibility, diffusing responsibility. Here we're drawing upon Albert Van Doer's um, pioneer work. Um, so it, all, it can all come, in, come together in this. And, and we think about uh, veterans as principal actors of, of direct violence uh, within the context of the military. There's layers of uh, association. There's instigators, accomplices, but also within the society, instigators, accomplices, and facilitating and enabling harm. And uh, to reflect uh, seriously to sh uh, on our moral responsibility in um, these dimensions. Uh, just with a positive kind of turn, just to think about how we can exercise backward looking moral responsibility. I like this idea of cultivating empathic unsettlement. Uh, of, of being appropriately unsettled um, and allowing ourselves to be appropriately troubled by what's going on. And, um, and then working it as Leroy has talked about uh, his own work in making amends and atonement, certainly not for veterans alone to do. And then this idea of forward looking, uh, what does it mean uh, collectively uh, to be forward looking um, and to avoid complicity, avoid moral exploitation and our enabling of war culture. Um, and maybe even as Rebel Art and Strasser talk about, as well as Andrew Basevich, advocating for policy reform, moving from an all volunteer option to a skin in the game option, which is uh, really, um, in my view, and in a number of people's views, a, a way to resolve the condition of moral exploitation uh, so that we have a more morally engaged public to have um, a skin in the game option uh, where um, we have uh, a return to the draft, essentially. Um, we call our group a moral engagement group because this is the work we're involved in, moving from moral disengagement towards moral engagement, both uh, individually, with veterans in their own spiritual and moral lives, but also collectively as a community. The community healing ceremony is uh, the work of moral engagement, of uh, telling it like it is, uh, accepting responsibility, attending to negative consequences, humanizing the other. All of these are elements and more of our work. Hope to see you at four. Uh, for more uh, experience of what uh, a ceremony is like. And I'm going to stop here and leave the last uh, 15 minutes or so for discussion. I just want to give everyone a reminder. So Chris and Peter here are hearing us through the microphones um, in our auditorium. So if you have something that you would like to say or a question to ask, um, me and my colleague will be walking around with microphones. So just make sure you have a microphone in their hand, in your hand when you um, speak so that we can make sure that our friends that are here with us virtually can hear you as well. You know, this is the first time we've had a majority veteran audience. Uh, you've heard a little bit, you've seen photos, you've heard some of the language we use about the military being used for violence, for harm. 
some of the language of reconciliation, atonement, shame about stemming from our service. Is it this is a little difficult for anybody? Was this tripping anybody out? Because you, you guys are all good. You're so much more emotionally healthy and evolved than I was because before I did the group, they said, hey, come to the ceremony and decide if it's for you. And when they had the um, civilians get up and form the circle, I was like, I looked at my psych, I was like, what is this hippie shit? Like, is this a drum circle? What are you doing? Why are you bringing me to this? And the language was very challenging for me. I got up and, and walked out of the room. Um, and looking back on it, it was because I was con being forced to confront some of the things that I was hiding from in a manner that was honest and engaged for the first time and not using euphemisms, not downplaying my part in it. It was, it was, it was tough for me. So, um, yeah, I was just curious uh, about the, the feedback from the veterans in the room, but everybody's kind of on the same page. So, um, I don't know if you've ever, for me, if you've ever been with other vets, people you serve with, you remember when you're in, you're talking about the civilian response, you're going, oh man, these people have no idea what we go through. They don't know what it's like for us. I remember there was a photo going around coming out of Iraq. It said, America's not at war. The, I was in the Marine Corps. We have to make everything about us, sorry. Uh, <laughs> America's not at war. The Marine Corps is at war. America's at the shopping mall, right? And that was something that I carried with me for a long time. And so how powerful to have a room full of people who weren't there, who didn't experience, say, tell us your story, we want to learn. What can we do better? How can we be better? And then I, I didn't have that, well, civilians don't understand, thing, to, that prop to fall back on. I didn't have that, they can't relate, they don't know what it's really like. Because I, I heard that a lot in my, my veteran community. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anybody can relate, if you have any responses. And if there are other questions, I don't want to talk over anybody either. I'm just kind of filling empty space. So, so. so I have, I, it's kind of a question, maybe uh, I'm just reaching out for help on recommendation. This is for any members of the panel by panel. I mean those uh, holding a microphone. Um, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the note I made was moral in the note I made was moral injury needs a community event to heal. But in my situation, I feel like I cannot even share it with uh, my parents or family because they can't relate and don't seem, or it seems like they don't care or want to know how I feel. Uh, when I came back from Iraq in 2009, uh, we returned to Fort Hood, Texas, well, formerly known, known as Fort Hood. And um, I see all these people running across the field, whether it be spouse, girlfriend, kids, whatever. And I had nobody from my family there, neither my parents. I understand why my kids weren't there. They were young, and they were really young when their mother and I got divorced. I was so angry, I probably didn't sleep for a day. Um, then when I retired uh, from the Army, again, same thing. None of my four sisters or my parents or my kids, which were teenagers by then, uh, came to... Well, I had to let the Army know ahead of time I was going to be at the ceremony, and I ended up canceling because none of my family said that they would make it. So I have been in counseling for years and I'm going to school, but it seems like, hey, I can't engage in a relationship and go to school at the same time. Um, while I was in Iraq in 2008, I found out my then wife had a kid by another person and it was like everything my whole world just narrowed down to like the size of a pinhole. I couldn't think, I couldn't process. And I had that again recently, a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't relationship related, but I just felt so overwhelmed, like I shut down mentally. How, 
<clears throat> how do I heal when it seems like I'm by myself, I'm on an island, or at least I can't expect any family members to be interested? I'd like to respond on to that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear a name, and if you don't want to share your name, that's that's totally okay. But your first name, Todd. It's Todd. Todd. Oh, it's Todd. Um, so it's so heart wrenching to hear your your experience, Todd. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the pain in your experience of coming home to such. Um, sense of isolation and, and almost abandonment I'm hearing. Um, and, and then the same kind of experience with that, with your retirement from the military. Um, and just, just, a, just a quick story about, because uh, the question is about the, the community and the, and the healing. And we, we did a ceremony, our last ceremony in December, uh, we had a veteran in the group um, who had invited uh, his wife, had invited family members to come to the ceremony and, and nobody came, nobody came. And um, this veteran was, had been going through, uh, had, a, had a order of protection against him, wasn't able to see his children and, and had come to our group really in crisis. Um, and, um, but, but was committed to our process and showed up for every group meeting and showed up for the ceremony and told the community in his testimony, at, in the context of our ceremony, he said every every member of my family I invited to come didn't show up, and I'm just glad that you're you know told the community that had gathered some 50 people who had showed up in person. I'm glad you're here because none of my family's here, and 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 that veteran was the last one in our group to speak, and and I I remember the moment of getting up, and. Um, and facing the community after after this veteran had said those words, and and I and I and I said, um, and I'm going to make up a name here. Um, I said it, it and, and we when when we have our ceremony, we have the veterans like Hannibal and Leroy who have gone through our group sitting right up at the front. Who, they want to come and support the the veterans uh, who are giving testimony, and we had a pretty good turnout. We had about ten or twelve veterans at this particular ceremony in December who had been through our group and were there right sitting up at the front. And I remember after, after Mark, I'm going to call him Mark, that's not his name, but uh, after Mark said those words that his, none of his family was there, I, I got up and said, if there are any members of, of Mark's family here tonight, please stand. And in that moment, all of those veterans immediately stood up. And as after they stood up, people in the community started standing up as well. And in, in a matter of like 30 seconds, everybody in that room was standing up with Mark in response to my question, is there a member of Mark's family here tonight? So I'm telling you that the story, Todd, not because, um, you know, that's going to make everything okay, that it's still sad and, and unfortunate, that the people that Mark invited didn't show up for him there. Um, but it also invites us to think more broadly about community and isolation and uh, uh, what it means to be connected. Um, and I can say that Mark left that ceremony feeling more, more connected, less alone. Um, and um, for other veterans, who um, have uh, invited family members and they've shown up for our ceremony. Um, often, Viet sometimes Vietnam veterans who brought their spouse or their son, they come into this ceremony setting and for the first time, the veterans are able to talk to their loved ones in the context of this community and say things that they were never able to say before. Uh, because where else can we find such a space to talk about these kinds of painful places where we can share with our loved ones and our loved one, ones will be around others who can support them? Uh, it's, 
it's been our experience that way. So I'm, I'm sorry for your experience. Uh, uh, what I, I'm, I'm hopeful is that you will show up for the ceremony that we're offering um, and that, that through this process, uh, you'll find some kind of connection um, and that you stay connected with us uh, and, and con uh, continue on, on this, this journey as you've uh, come and shown up today. Thank you, Chris, Peter, Leroy, and Hannibal. Thank you for sharing your work and your experiences with us, and thank you for the work that you continue to do uh, in support of, uh, of our veterans. Uh, thank you. There's gonna be four breakout sessions this morning. Uh, the Art of Being a Veteran, How to Find Meaning and Purpose After Service. That'll be in room 107D. Kent County Veteran Resources in room 109D. The Cumulative Effect of Stress and Burnout on PTSD Among First Responders in room 117E. And the Impact of Trauma in Healthcare, Therapeutic Considerations for Supporting Healers in room 121E. And those, uh, those room numbers can be found in, in the programs. Um, at this time, we're gonna go ahead and take a short break. And then just a reminder that the breakout sessions will begin at 10 a.m. Thank you.